Open your Bibles, if you will, to the last chapter of the last book. Chapter 22 of Revelation. And we will look today, I know it says 13 to 16, we'll look at 12 to 16, and you'll understand why momentarily. As you look here at verses 12 through 16. As we look at this text, if you, if you have a, a, a red letter edition of the Bible, you will find that we begin and end with red letters, begin and end with the Lord, Lord's words. And if you look in the middle of there, um, verses 14 and 15, look like they are framed by the red letters, and they actually are. Uh, this is kind of a mini chiasm or a mini frame. We've talked about these, these frames before. And this is one of those frames where on the outside of the frame, you have the same thing. There is the announcement and identity of the Christ. So that would be the outside frame. You see that in verses 12 and 13, and also there in verse 16. It's the same thing. There is an announcement and an identification of Christ. In the middle of it, you have the identification of the blessing of the saints and the curse of sinners. And so this package all together is a picture of Christ, who is the judge, and the effect of the judgment that he brings. The effect of the judgment that he brings is twofold. One, it is a blessing for the righteous. And two, it is a curse or condemnation for the unrighteous. And all of it is tied up in this idea of Christ and who he is. In both cases, this identification is crucial. That's why it comes at the beginning and the end of this picture. The identity of the two groups is contingent upon their relationship to Christ. That's what makes them who they are. That's what makes them what they are. It's their relationship to Christ. There's a reference here to their deeds. However, their deeds are a direct result of their relationship or lack thereof with Christ or the nature of their relationship with Christ because everyone has a relationship with Christ. Amen? You hear people talk about that all the time, you know. Do you have a relationship with Christ? Do you have a personal relationship with Christ? You don't ever have to ask anyone that question. The answer to that question is always yes. Amen. We all have a relationship to Christ. For some, he is our deliverer. For the others, he is our judge. In both cases, it's a relationship. And in both cases, it's personal. Amen? Secondly, the authority of Christ to reward or judge is contingent upon his identity. So again, in both instances, his identity is central. First of all, his identity is central because that's how we identify who these people are and to which group they belong, their relationship with him. And secondly, his ability to judge and his authority to judge is tied up. It is linked inexorably to who he is. So both of those things are important as we look at this passage of the Scripture. Beginning at verse 12. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Amen. This is a powerful yet brief statement. In this statement, first and foremost, we see a picture of who Christ is. 
He identifies himself clearly at both the beginning and the end of the statement. Let's look at his identity in the first part of the statement as the judge comes. It's almost a picture of a judge. Here's the way I view this, 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 this passage of Scripture. Here comes the judge. The judge walks in, and it's all rise. The honorable Jesus Christ presiding. And, and, and he comes to his bench, and he's identified as he comes to the bench. And then judgment is passed. And then after judgment is passed, it's all rise again as the judge departs. As he enters, behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me. First, Christ is the judge of the world. His judgment, number one, is imminent. He says, behold, I am coming soon. His judgment is imminent. Now, again, we've talked about this before, but it's almost ironic to say that in light of the fact that we're looking back some 2,000 years, and it's been said for all that time that his judgment is imminent, and his judgment is imminent. And as has already been noted, when we think about Christ's imminent judgment, we do not think of it in terms of our own understanding. We don't think of it in terms of the way we count time. Again, we've said on a number of occasions, Peter's statement about with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day is quite appropriate here. God is not bound by time. So when we say that it is imminent, what we mean is it could be at any time. It was true then, and it's true now. And should the Lord tarry for another thousand years, it will still be true that the Lord could come at any time. But you and I do not know when that time is, which has again been stated here earlier in another chapter. That picture of him coming as a thief, but his coming is imminent. But there's another sense in which we understand the imminence of Christ's return in this regard, because as the judge, um, all of us could die at any moment. And in that moment, we will face him as our redeemer or as our judge. So while this is talking about the broader reality at the end of the age, there is also a sense in which for every one of us, this is but a heartbeat away. This judgment is imminent. And that's part of the idea here. Part of the idea of this particular set of statements is that we would examine ourselves. We're coming to the close of the letter. And it's time for us to recognize that this is not just an academic exercise. But this has been communicated for a reason. And the reason is that the judgment is imminent. Both in terms of Christ who could come at any moment, and also in terms of you who could meet God at any moment, it's only a heartbeat away. Secondly, his judgment is warranted. He says, I'm bringing my recompense. The Greek word that is used here as recompense is sometimes translated as wages, other times it's translated as uh, payment. I'm bringing my recompense. Sometimes it's translated as reward. He says, I'm coming and I'm bringing my recompense with me. We've already seen that individuals are going to be judged according to what they do, according to what they have done, according to their deeds. It's more than that, though. It's not only our deeds. Because again, in order for a deed to be righteous, it has to be the right thing done the right way for the right reason. If you do the right thing, but you don't do it the right way, you don't do it for the right reason, it's not right. It's like the man who is in the midst of a war. And in the midst of that war, he jumped on a grenade. He'd seen it happen before. The individual who did it was heralded as a hero because he saved his unit. So lo and behold, the opportunity comes and the man jumps and he falls on the grenade and he dies. He opens his eyes in hell, much to his dismay, and he can't believe it. I just jumped on a grenade and I just saved my men, and here I am in hell. 
What gives? Shouldn't I be in the other place? I mean, that was a heroic deed that saved the lives of others. Yes, it was a heroic deed that saved the lives of others, and you did it because you thought that doing it would make you a hero. In other words, you did it for yourself more than for anyone else. You did it because you thought it would make God indebted to you and that somehow God would owe you entrance into his kingdom because of your deed, which again is completely and utterly selfish. If it's not the right thing done the right way for the right reason, and by the way, the only right reason is the glory and honor of God, then it is sinful. Another way to say this, that which is not of faith is sin. So when we say that there is a reward for deeds, understand that we're not talking here in terms of a scorecard where certain deeds are worth certain points and the points are added up at the end. Because the fact of the matter is, apart from Christ, you have no score. His judgment is also individual. Notice he says, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. It's individual. Everyone's judgment is individual. We will stand before God and be judged individually. This is important for us to un- for understand. This is important for us to grasp. As parents, it's important for us to understand that we can't be righteous for our children. Amen? As children, it's important for us to understand our, our parents can't be righteous for us. But it's also important for us to understand that the other way. Our children can't be unrighteous for us. Our parents can't be unrighteous for us. There is not a sense in which God will judge us for what others have done. We will be judged based upon our own actions and thoughts and attitudes and words and deeds. This judgment is individual. You have to answer to Jesus. You have to stand before his throne. You individually. And when you stand before God, it will not be like judgment in our understanding. Because judgment in our understanding goes something like this. Did did you hit the lady in her head and take her purse? Well, see, actually, you know, what happened was, was you know, I, I, I'm poor. Didn't ask you if you were poor. I asked you if you hit the lady in your head and took her purse. Well, you know, actually, I grew up without a father. Okay, fine. But that's not what I asked you. I asked you if you hit the lady in the head and took her purse. Well, you know, actually, I have a drug problem. It's fine. Didn't ask you about your drug problem. I asked you if you did what you did. See, the way we think about justice is so incredibly clouded. We blame our environment. We blame our upbringing. We blame our circumstances. Listen, when you stand before God, the question will not be, did you have the right parents? Did you have the right upbringing? Did you have the right environment? That's not the question. When you sin, it's because you are a sinner. That's why you sin. And the fact of the matter is the reason that the environment, the reason that the world works on you and affects you is because of your own sinful desires. You ever notice how even when we're blaming our environment for our sin, the the environment can only make us go so far? I mean, you ask a person who says, well, you know, I did this because of the way that I was raised. And you look at that same person and say, well, well, how come you never did whatever? You think about something else horrible. And they say, oh, no, I would never do that. Well, well, why? Because if, if the environment is the problem, then you should be willing to do anything, right? But there's certain things that you won't do. You see, the reason that your environment was allowed to influence you in the way that it did is because of the desires that you already had. Take two men. And put a glass of scotch in front of them. One who's never had a drink before, doesn't have a proclivity toward alcohol, 
doesn't have those physical desires in him, will look at it and keep on walking. Another man whose body has tasted and enjoyed and gotten used to tasting and enjoying will all of a sudden begin to have huge problems as he stands and looks at the exact same glass. What's the difference? The difference is the desires on the inside of us. See, there's a reason that we give in to our environment. And that is because of who we are as sinners. So it's not as though we are morally neutral and the environment comes in and turns us into sinners. The fact of the matter is we are sinful and the environment merely gives us opportunities to express our sinfulness. The things that we like and crave, we run after them. The things that we don't, we don't think about. But we don't avoid those things. The man who can walk by that glass of scotch, he doesn't walk by it because he's good. He just has another proclivity. And if you found what that thing was, he'd start having the same kinds of problems. It is not your environment. It is not your upbringing. It is your sinfulness. It is your nature. And this is essential as we understand the gospel. Because if I believe that my problem is my environment, I don't need a savior. I just need a new address. If I believe that my problem is the world, I don't need a savior. I just maybe need to get my TV out of my house. My problem is my environment. I may just need to get away from some of my friends. I don't need to be born again. Because there's nothing wrong with me. The problem is out there. Do, do, do you see how that perverts our understanding of the gospel? Again, I'm not saying that there's not a problem out there. There is a problem out there. But the reason that the problem out there is a problem in here is because there's also a problem in here that likes what the problem out there is bringing to it. According to what he has done, this judgment is individual. You will stand before God and answer for your words, for your thoughts, and for your deeds. You will. And it will not be children playing in the courtyard kind of answers that will suffice. Yeah, but he hit me first. But what did you do? We also see here that Christ is the judge because he's God. There's a phrase used here three times in this passage that we've looked at. And that, that phrase is, I am. That's an important phrase. He says, behold, I am am coming soon. And then he says again, I am the Alpha and the Omega, first and last, beginning and the end. I am, I am, I am. And then in that last verse, we have another I am. We have an I, Jesus, and then we have an I am, the root and the descendant of David. This I am phrase is important. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14 when Moses is standing there being confronted by God and he says, whom shall I say has sent me? Basically, what is your name? God says to Moses in verse 14 of chapter 3, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. John chapter 8, verses 56 to 59, same author as the author of Revelation, is the one who records this. Jesus says, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out to the temple. Why did they pick up stones? Because he identified himself as the I am, as God. 
Don't you ever let anybody tell you Jesus never identified himself as God. He also says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Turn with me to the left and look at the beginning of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. And verse 8. This is the first time we see this phrase. Notice what it says. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So now Jesus says, first of all, I am, and in case you think, well, that's not enough, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The same phrase was used to reference God in chapter 1. Jesus is God. He is the second person of the Trinity. There in that same paragraph in chapter 1, there is the identity of all of the persons of the Trinity. The identity of the Father and of the Son and of the Spirit. And we've seen that reiterated throughout Revelation. Not only have we seen that, but we've seen the unholy Trinity, which is actually the opposite of the true holy Trinity. So we see that God the Father is God, God the Son is God, God the Spirit is God, but the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father. One God in three persons. One in their unity and communion and essence and nature, but distinct in their person. So Christ can judge because he's God. He's the only one who can judge because he is God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. He is God. And this is crucial. First of all, because he's God, He is able to reward the righteous. Look at verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Now, this is the seventh, again, numbers in the book of Revelation, so incredibly important. We've seen seven iterations of this picture of history and history being brought to its consummation. And we see these things repeating. We've talked about recapitulation again and again and again. These seven vignettes. There are also seven blessings or seven beatitudes in the book of Revelation. This is the seventh one. The first one is Revelation 1-3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. The second one is in chapter 14 verse 3. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. There's blessing and deeds again. 16, 15 is the third beatitude. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. There's blessing in garments again. The fourth one, Revelation 19, 9. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Number five, chapter 20 and verse six. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. The sixth one, chapter 22, verse 7. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And now the the final. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and they may enter the city by the gates. The righteousness here is an alien righteousness. It's interesting. He says that he has come with his recompense and he's going to reward everyone according to their deeds, according to what they've done. What have these people done? They washed their robes. There's one other time when we see this reference, and that's in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14, talking about those who survive 
this great tribulation. I said to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. In the blood of the lamb. What makes their robes white? The blood of the lamb. This is not works righteousness. This is righteousness as as a result of Christ's work. This is not righteousness that is earned. This is righteousness that is imputed. This is not righteousness that is our own. This is righteousness that is alien. It is an alien righteousness. It is a righteousness that is ours because of the blood of Christ. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. That is how you wash your robes white. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters lifted me. Now safe am I. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It is only the blood of Christ that washes us clean. This is his sacrificial substitutionary death on the cross on our behalf. Make no mistake about it. Those who stand before him and are blessed and are righteous and have on white robes are not there because they're better than other people or because their environments were more pure than other people or because their parents did a better job than other people. It will be because they have come to Christ in repentance and faith because they have believed in his finished work, because they have cried out to him for mercy, and having cried out, they are washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's who's blessed. Those who trust in Christ and Christ alone. Their righteousness is evident. Righteousness is evident in their deeds. It has an impact. We see this in Revelation 19, 7 and 8. I believe this is related Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So this washing, this righteousness is an alien righteousness. It is Christ's righteousness, but it is also an active righteousness It is a righteousness that makes us positionally righteous. We are right with God positionally, but it also makes us actually righteous. We actually walk in righteousness. We actually walk in holiness. Upright and circumspect before the Lord. Why? Because the spirit that raised Christ from the dead abides in us. We are made new, we are made whole, we are made clean. Our very inclinations are changed. Our desires are changed because of the finished work of Christ and his imputed righteousness. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We are righteous and that righteousness will manifest itself. And we will grow in that righteousness. We will despise sin increasingly as we grow in that righteousness. We will be aware of it increasingly as we grow in that righteousness. It is so ironic because oftentimes what happens with believers is we'll go through, we'll go through this, this, these kind of phases. And you have believers and, and we're introduced you know, to Christ and his righteousness and we're transformed and we look and we see the, the, the sins and they're easy to spot because it's the big stuff. It's all the big stuff, you know? And the world is just black and white. And then we get to a place where, you know, we've taken care of the big stuff and we're okay for a while. And then there's another place that believers come to. And that's the place where you recognize that even though you're not doing the big stuff, you're still struggling with the same things. They're just not manifesting themselves like they used to. 
And all of a sudden, you're thinking about the minutia of sin. And sometimes that can bring you to a point of crisis because you can think, you know, after all this time, I'm still a rotten, ruined, dirty scoundrel just like I was. Maybe I'm not even saved at all. You know what's so ironic about that? In the believer, the only reason that matters is because you're saved. My favorite thing to say to believers when they come to me, and they say, I'm just struggling. What are you struggling with? I'm, I'm just struggling with assurance of my salvation. I'm struggling with believing that I'm saved because I see this sin in myself, and I hate this sin in myself, and I'm worried against it. I'm not gaining victory. I'm not, so stop right there. I've heard enough. What do you mean? I haven't even begun to tell you. You don't have to. I've heard enough. I've heard you're struggling and you're at war. You're on the right side. Now, we can talk about mortifying your sin, but we're not talking about your salvation anymore. Because who do you think makes you hate the sin in you? Do you think you could be lost and hate the sin in you? You think you could be lost and struggling with the sin in you? You think you could be lost and at war with the sin in you? Now, granted, we need to fight, but you need to understand the side you're on as you fight. Thank God for that. Thank God that you hate your sin. Thank God that you see it even in the smallest ways. Thank God that it bothers you still. Thank God that you don't want it to be a part of you. Thank God that you recognize that it ought not be so. Thank God that you don't want it to be so. Thank God for that. That's the grace of God in your life. So yes, we're actually righteous, but that righteousness increases in us, which means we're still sinners. But we're saved. We're saints. We're saints. We're saints who remember some stuff. Some of it too fondly. Amen? We're saints. And that righteousness is rewarded. There's two things here. I love these. First, there's the tree of life. The first Adam was excluded from this tree. The last Adam brings us back to it. Hallelujah. <laughs> the tree of life. God's bringing this thing full circle. And there we have access to the tree of life. And secondly, the city. So first, our union with the first Adam has been transformed. We're no longer under his federal headship. We're now under the federal headship of the last Adam. And then the city, there's a picture of the city, the bride of Christ, our union with the last Adam is finally realized and consummated. This is the reward. The reward is eternal life in perfect union with Christ. That's the reward. Eternal life in perfect union with Christ. This goes back to the other issue of our constant struggle with sin as believers. You know, one of the other reasons that we get so upset about that, because we have, you heard this word, you heard this word before, I'm going to say it again, an over-realized eschatology. We want things that belong to the age to come, but we want to experience them in the present age. So in the age to come, I will be perfect. In the age to come, my communion with Christ will be unbroken. In the age to come, there will be no more sin in me. But that's the age to come. But when I look at myself in the here and now, and I don't see what's been promised to me in the age to come, and I get upset with myself or upset with God, I have an overrealized eschatology. It's like the kid who's upset because he knows what he's going to get on his birthday, but his birthday hasn't come yet. And so he's depressed. What's the matter? I didn't get my gift today. It's not your birthday. 
I know, but I just want my gift. You're like eight months away from your birthday. I know, but I just, I just want it. I just really want it. And I'm just, I woke up today and I didn't have it. And I'm just, I just don't even know if you even love me because I woke up today and I don't have my gift that you said you were going to get me. They see, we hear that and we chuckle. But that's you and me with our overrealized eschatology. I know, but you said that this sin was going to be taken away from me and that I wouldn't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah, that's when you die. You're not dead yet. I know, but still. Then there's the punishment of the unrighteous. Notice this. There's been all these statements about Christ returning and crushing his enemies. Vivid picture in 19 of this warrior who comes and dispatches his foes. Notice how understated this is. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, and the sexually immoral, and murderers, and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. There is one word that describes their judgment here. Everything else describes them. One word describes their judgment. Outside. That's it. That's all. Outside. What's our reward? Tree of life, eternal life, city, perfect communion and union with Christ. Where are they? Outside. Where there is no tree and there is no communion. Justice is served. We don't see a picture here of justice being served. We've already seen the picture of justice being served. But now we see a picture of the result of that justice having been served. Christ is vindicated. These these individuals are outside the gates. The wicked get what they have desired and deserved. Let me say that again. The wicked get what they desire and deserve. It's always ironic to me when we talk about people who never wanted to be with Christ or never wanted to be with Christians, never wanted to be with the church, and they die, and we say that they've gone to a better place to be with the God that they didn't want to be with here. How does that work? These individuals never wanted God, they never wanted Christ. They wanted themselves and their own desires. That's what they were characterized by. They didn't want to be with God, and now they get what they desired and what they deserve. It's a familiar list. In 21 chapter 8, we have an almost identical list. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, uh, immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars, their portion will be the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. We have the introduction of the idea of dogs, that which is detestable. It's not an exhaustive list. It's a symbolic list. On this edition of the dogs, listen to this from Alan Johnson. Such are the dogs, i.e. those who practice magic arts, etc. Vis-a-vis those who rebel against the rule of God. Deuteronomy 23, 18, where the dog signifies male prostitutes. Matthew 11, or 15, 26, where dogs refer to Gentiles. Philippians 3, 2 to 3, where dogs refers to the Judaizers. There is no doubt that such people will not be admitted through the gates of the holy city. Dogs, just kind of an all-encompassing term here. The sexually immoral, kind of an all-encompassing term here. Murderers and idolaters, again, murderers has to do with the horizontal commandments. Idolaters has to do with the vertical commandments. And those who love and practice falsehood, it's everybody. Everybody who's false. Everybody who's idolatrous. Everybody who's hate-filled. All of them. And the kind of capstone of all of that is dogs. 
This is horrendous language. There is no boasting or gloating here. It is just a simple, understated fact that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom. The unrighteous will not be with Christ. The unrighteous will not taste of the tree of life. The unrighteous will not be part of that city, the bride of Christ. The unrighteous are simply outside. Well, what happens to the lake of fire? There's still lake of fire. All of that's still true. But again, this is just a restatement. And in this restatement, the point that's being made here is not so much a point about the punishment that is being endured by the unrighteous, but the statement here is about the distance and distinction between those who are his and are with him and those who are outside. And finally, all rise. The verdict has been rendered. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. There is a reiteration here of the deity of Christ. First, I, Jesus, sent my angel. Um, This early on is attributed to the Father who sent his angel with this message. So again, Christ is being identified with the Father. But there are a couple of things being said here. Number one, you've been warned. You've been warned. The immediate warning of revelation itself. I sent my angel. We see that in the first part. But there's also the broader warning of the law and the prophets. He says, I'm the root and the descendant of David. In other words, you, you've been warned. I, I've warned you here in this particular book, but you've also been warned by the rest of the Bible. He is the one who has been promised. He is the root and the descendant of David. He is the promised Messiah. So it's not like this is new. You've been warned again and again and again, and this is your last warning. Kind of like being at the airport. Last and final call. I counted one time. And they said that six times. Sometimes, sometimes it gets crucial. Sometimes it's the last and final call in general for the flight. Sometimes it's Davis party of two. Last and final call. In case you were wondering... We're waiting for you. Davis, party of two. This is your last and final call. And they say it again and again and again and again and again. And when they do that, here's what happens. We sit there and we go, really? How? It's not really the last and final call because you said it six times. Come on, people. Just say last and final call and then close the door and leave unless you're Davis, party of two. Then you run, huffing and puffing, and out of breath. And they've given you the last and final call six times. And you give them your ticket. And you smile at them. And you thank them. And you get on the plane. And the door closes. And you take a deep breath. then you're not annoyed that they said it six times or 16 times. You're just grateful for the time when you heard it. And you're just grateful that you were there to hear it. And that's ultimately the message here. We need to respond to this last and final call. And you can look at it and say, yeah, but this last and final call has been out there for so long. That's the wrong way to look at this. For the unbeliever, you need to believe that Jesus is God 
that he's the second person of the Trinity. Last and final call. You need to believe in the sinfulness of sin and in the sinfulness of your sin. Last and final call. You need to believe in the atonement of Christ and that the atonement of Christ is the only payment for sin that is acceptable and that it's your only hope and that only through Christ dying for your sin and you receiving that by faith and turning from your sin can you be made right with God and make it last and final call. You need to believe in the judgment to come and that that judgment is imminent and that you stand right in the crosshairs last and final call to the believer we need to examine ourselves when you hear the last and final call are you annoyed Or are you anxious that Davis Party of Two will get on board? (laughs) If you're annoyed, you're arrogant and prideful and selfish because you don't care about Christ having the fullness of his reward. All you care about is you having a seat. Shame on you. Shame on you if you're annoyed when you hear the call of the gospel. Shame on you if you're tired of hearing the call of the gospel. When you hear the call of the gospel and you hear last and final call again and again and again, you don't get annoyed if you know what it's like. If you remember what it's like. You rejoice. You rejoice in the fact that you heard the last and final call. And you rejoice in the fact that Christ is still making that last and final call. And that with everyone who hears and everyone who responds and everyone who heeds, Christ is glorified all the more and we get that much closer. to the final consummation of all things. Last and final call. Let's pray. Father, We bow before you as a humble people and a grateful people. Grateful that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For those of us who are his, our gratitude is overwhelming. We also bow before you as a humble people and a desperately wicked and needy people. For those under the sound of my voice who have not heeded that final call, my prayer for you is that you would be merciful and that in your mercy they would be saved. Lord, we bow before you as a grateful body of believers who rejoice in the great privilege of commemorating week after week after week the mercy that has been bestowed upon us through the person and work of Christ. And we bow before you as an anxious body of believers desperate to see the gospel proclaimed and sinners saved And Father, I pray that for all of us, we would embrace this truth. 
from whatever side of the gate we find ourselves. That those who are on the outside would repent and run to Christ and come in. And that those who are on the inside would rejoice. Walk in righteousness. And proclaim the truth like one beggar telling other beggars where we found bread. Grant by your grace that this would mark us. We pray these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.